So we're going to be in chapter 5 of the Gospel of Mark, starting at verse 21. Lord willing and time permitting, we'll go through the entirety of this chapter. And just by way of review, I just want to share a few things. It's so important when you open up God's Word to know where you are in God's Word. It would be a tragedy just to kind of do Scripture roulette and kind of go, well, that must be what God's saying, without a sense of what God has been saying throughout the entirety of the text. All I'm saying is context is important. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know this, that the Gospel of Mark was written by who? Yeah, you know that. And Mark, well, he was a companion, most likely, of the Apostle Peter. So what we're reading, what, what we're getting in this Gospel is definitely Mark's perspective, but filtered and guided and, and really informed by the Apostle Peter. And he's writing this Gospel account to primarily those in the first century that would have been somewhat of a Roman background. And this gospel is interesting. One author describes this book this way. I've shared this before, but it's helpful to frame what we're doing. He says, the gospel of Mark is fast moving and hard hitting. And in rapid fire succession, here's what's happening in the gospel of Mark. Mark is using specific events. Not all of the things that happen in the life of Jesus, but specific events. Why? What's the purpose? To make us feel good on a Sunday morning. Well, no, no. What's the purpose? Here's the purpose. To prove, primarily to a Roman audience, but to prove that Jesus, he is the Christ, that he's the Son of God, who served, who suffered, who died, and who rose again. That, that's the point of this book. That, that's why Mark authored it. The goal of the Gospel of Mark, he moves so quickly through the life of Jesus. The language that he uses for those that would have been reading it in that first century, it would have jolted his readers. Some of the things that he says was, goodness gracious, do you see what Mark is claiming about Jesus? It would have jolted his readers into an understanding of who Jesus is. Now, you know who he is. We've been covering this theme over and over again. Who's Jesus? Jesus is the? He's the king, right? He's the? He's the son of God. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the son of God. And he's sovereign. I mean, he's in control. He has authority. He has power over all. And as we've been studying through this book over the last few months, here's what we've seen. We've seen Mark share much about who Jesus is, that he's the King, the Messiah, the Son of God, and providing evidence to validate this. He's giving us insights into his teachings about this message that he would constantly preach everywhere, that the kingdom of God, the rule, the reign, the authority, the presence of God is now, is now in your life. And we're in chapter 5 this morning. And what's happening in chapter 5 is Mark is sharing these four different accounts, four different episodes, four different encounters with Jesus that Mark kind of strings together to prove Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. That he's not just a teacher with interesting and insightful stories or just a pontificator of parables. He's not just one among many when it comes to religious or social or cultural things to say. He's not a TikToker. He's not a YouTuber. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus is more than that. He's more than one who's just providing teaching. Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. And where we are in chapter 5, Mark is stringing together four different examples to show us that. In chapter 4, he shows us that Jesus has authority, has power, has victory, I guess you could say, even over nature, natural disaster, danger. 
In chapter 4, he calmed the wind and the waves as his disciples and he were in a boat together. And this is something, listen, especially in those minds of those who are first reading this, that's something only God could do. In that first century mindset, the sea, the ocean, that was seen as chaos, mysterious. Only God could control that. And in chapter 4, Jesus speaks, and the winds and the waves, as the original language kind of puts it, are, are muzzled, right? They come under his authority. And sometimes maybe when you're in Sunday school and you hear that story, I, I can think of little Leo, my, my four-year-old, sharing that story with me. Dad, Jesus spoke in the wind and the water. They just calmed. And there can be that sense of, man, gentle Jesus speaking serenely. And everything just came together like a northwest Florida Gulf Coast sunset. And everyone was just, oh, roses and rainbows, Jesus. Well, was that the response? I mean, if you look at verse 41 of chapter 4, I'll just read it to you. After everything finally calmed, there's no more wind, there's no more waves. Do you know what it says? The disciples, those who had been with Jesus, they were absolutely terrified. Terrified. Because this one who was in the boat with them, the one who'd been teaching these parables, whom they'd seen provide miraculous works, he, he just spoke and the wind and the waves calmed. And this is what it says. They're terrified because they say, who is this man? That, that, that he could just speak and the wind and the waves would calm. It wasn't a sense of, oh, Jesus spoke and we just serenely are following him and we love it. No, th there's something about this man. He's more than a YouTuber or a TikToker or someone just sharing you know, his perspective on things. This guy, Jesus, he's the king. He, he's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Last Sunday, Pastor John opened up chapter 5. And it's not only physical danger that comes under the authority of Jesus, but the spiritual realm. Oppression and possession from demonic forces, they come under the authority of Jesus. And it may be a little bit of a different context, but if you look at verse 17, there's also this sense of fear when Jesus does this. This sense of awe. This dynamic in chapter 5, verse 17, where the crowd pleads with Jesus, go away. Now, some of that, if you remember from last week, might be because they're just trying to, you know, cover their income, so to speak. Possibly. But there's this theme. Jesus does something that only God can do, and there's this sense of awe. There's this sense of, of fear. There's this sense of otherness. Who is this man? Do you see what he's doing? Danger and the demonic, they're no match for him. This morning, we'll consider together kind of the last two accounts that Mark is stringing together from the life of Jesus. We'll see that he has authority and victory over disease. There'll be a woman that comes to him with an issue that she's had for 12 years. But also Jesus has victory and authority over death. There'll be a man that comes with a daughter of 12 years old. And through both of these accounts that we'll see this morning, I want to go ahead and kind of give you the, the point, the purpose. If someone were to say, so what was the sermon about this morning? Here it is. It's the same thing we've been saying week over week. Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God, sovereign and all powerful. And here's the reality, church. Danger, the demonic, disease and death, they cannot touch him. Why? Because he is the one that's been promised. He's the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. He's the king. He's the son of God. That's the point to those in the first century and to us this morning in the 21st century. Can I ask you a question? Do you think there's some confusion in the 21st century of who's in control, of who should call the shots, of who should define, fill in the blank? Do you think there's some confusion to that? Most definitely. Mark writes this account from thousands of years ago. That's in the first century context. 
And his point is to prove that there is one who's king. There is one who's sovereign. There is one who's been promised. There is one who has authority. Let me prove it to you. The demons can't touch him. Physical danger can't touch him. And this morning, as we consider the last half of chapter 5, we'll see that disease and death cannot touch Jesus. Father, I pray as we open your word that you'd open our hearts. Lord, I need you to be able to do something that I'm fully aware that I, I just never seem to have any ability to do whatsoever. But that's to see you, by your Holy Spirit, illuminate the truth of your word, to speak to hearts of men and women. Lord, I, I do believe that your word is a living and active book, that it speaks to us. So God, would you do what I can't do? Would you speak to your people? Lord, I ask for the grace and the ability to be able to share, to teach, to to open up your word, but I know my limitations. I know what I have to offer. And Lord, I'm asking that you would do more than what I can do this morning in just opening up your word. God, that you'd change hearts, that you'd change minds, that you'd change lives, that you would instruct and encourage, correct, align our hearts, our attitudes, our mindsets with you. Wash over us this morning with your word and speak to your people. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Let's first look at this this third account, but this first account for us this morning to prove who Jesus is. It says in the New Living Translation that Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, my little daughter is dying, he said. Please come, lay your hands on her, heal her so she can live. This is interesting. A a leader of the local synagogue, Jairus, his daughter is dying. And he finds himself on that day amongst the crowd on the shoreline. And this isn't just a gathering of a few interested people, right? Oh, I hear Jesus is coming back. Maybe we should should check him out after we get a falafel or something. No, this scene is intriguing. Jesus is coming back from the eastern side of the lake, which is predominantly Gentile, where he's been rejected. Now he's coming back to the western side, which is predominantly Jewish, and there's a huge crowd. In the language that's written here in the Greek, it says almost that they're like gathered on top of him. And there's Jairus. He's waiting. He's pressing up against the crowds so that he can get to Jesus as soon as he steps off that boat. We know why. The text tells us his daughter is dying. He's in a place of desperation. Challenged for sure. But is there another level here on which this was challenging for Jairus to be there on that shoreline that day? I think so. I mean, first and foremost, his people, his community, his friends, his co-workers, potentially his, his family, the people he did life with, wanted nothing to do with this guy named Jesus. They were against him. As we've seen through the Gospel of Mark up until this point, it seems like any time Jesus steps into the synagogue, especially amongst the Pharisees, the the religious elite of the day, those who were seen in a good light, they were accusing Jesus of being demon-possessed. They're out to get him. Everyone around Jairus that day, his community... Co-workers, friends, family. I don't know that they would have supported him being there that day. But what does he do? He still comes to Jesus. It's a tough day for Jairus. His daughter's dying. He's doing something that all those around him probably don't support whatsoever. But also it tells us in the text that he's a synagogue leader. What does that mean? Well, that means that he would have been the one that would have Organized, who's leading prayer and reading from the Torah on the Sabbath. He would have looked after the facility itself and handled even the, the income that would have come into the synagogue that would have been distributed to the needs of the poor. 
This is a guy that's trusted in the community. If you're on the beach that morning or that afternoon when Jesus is coming back and you, you see Jairus there, you go, okay, there's Jairus. Huh. He has a good position. It's prestigious to a certain degree. And what Mark writes about him, falling to his feet, pleading, this isn't something you would dream of, seeing someone in this position doing, falling down to this kind of itinerant preacher's feet. Everyone else is against Jesus, and there's Jairus. Everyone he would have looked up to, his friends, his leadership, they wanted to kill Jesus, but he's there to beg from Jesus. And the language here is intense. The New Living Translation says pleading fervently. It means to beg with intensity. Jesus, you've got to help me. My little girl is dying. I mean, any parent of a child can probably easily set yourself into the sandals of how Jairus must have been feeling that day. You know what it's like for maybe something to happen to one of your kids that's unexplainable, that you can't get your head wrapped around, that you don't know what's going on. I'll never forget years ago, our family was traveling somewhere. It had been a long day in the car. We finally got to the place that we were going to be, get the kids all settled down, say prayers, get them tucked in. And one of our little girls, she was just kind of breathing heavily, almost like labored breathing. So we just kind of prayed over and said, okay, I'll just kind of keep my eyes on her. And 30 seconds, a minute goes by, and that breathing just gets more and more intense. We go in the room, turn the light on, and her face is starting to swell. She, she can't breathe. We're probably eight or nine hours away from home. Don't really know the immediate area, but I know in that moment, I've got to get my little girl to an ER. I don't know what's going on. Never experienced anything like this. So I find an emergency room just minutes from the place we're staying, and I get my little girl into the ER, and I'm in that place that Jairus is in. Hey, you got to help me. It's like 1 in the morning at this time. I don't know what's going on with my, my daughter. She can barely breathe. Her face is starting to swell. I'll never forget the intensity of that moment. I'll never forget that moment one day coming home from work, and the kids are crying. Now, that's not uncommon when you come home from work. You know, it's a long day. Kids are crying, but I, I come into the living room and there's, there's blood on the couch. There, there's gobs of tissue paper and toilet paper and paper towels with blood everywhere. Kids are crying. I'm like, okay, something's going on. Go into the bathtub and I, and I see my, one of my little boys just coughing up like blood clots, like not like a little nosebleed or like, what is going on? We, we got to figure that what's going on. How, what do we need to do? So I'm texting. Okay, let's get to the ER. And I'm texting everyone. Please pray for my little boy. Now, I want to say this as a disclaimer. Both my daughter and son are fine. They're alive. They're doing well. We figured those things out. But the point of this is to share. I know what it's like to a certain degree, not to the same degree of what Jairus was feeling, but to be in this place of desperation. What's happening? I don't understand. I'll do anything I can to figure out what needs to be done to help my little baby. That's Jairus. He's on his heels. He's willing to do anything to see his daughter healed. And his position didn't give him freedom from the challenges and trials and sad things that life can bring. We're all in those sandals. No position, no place in life can do anything for us when challenges like death come knocking on our door. And where does this lead him? It leads him to desperation. That desperation leads him to a place where he reaches out to Jesus. And he simply says, if you can just lay your hands on her and heal her so she can live. And I love Jesus' response in verse 24. Look at what it says. So Jesus went with him. If you've been going through the Gospel of Mark with us, let's just take a poll. Jesus is kind of lazy. He doesn't do too much. His days are kind of easy. Or no, his days are very full. How many would say he's, he's kind of a lazy Savior? How many would say, no, his, his plate looks full? Yeah, as, you, as we've been walking through this book, he's got a lot going on. This synagogue leader who maybe kind of hangs out with the people that wants to kill Jesus comes to Jesus and says, you got to help me. 
And what does Jesus do? Well, I'll tell you what he doesn't do. He doesn't send a couple of the disciples or a delegation or just say, can I just speak a word? Have you heard about what I can do? Like, he went with him. This is kind of a sub point, but it's a big point. Don't miss the heart of God for you. God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus. And not just as a, a payment for your sin, but Jesus came in flesh. <laughs> There's this theological, the incarnation, God becoming man. Why? Well, as the angel would tell Mary and Joseph, his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. God being with his people is both a promise and a predominant truth without the, throughout the Bible. Isaiah 41.10 says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Zephaniah 3, The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Many of us are familiar with this promise from the book of Hebrews. The author quotes this from Deuteronomy, where it's spoken of God that he says, I will never, what church? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. No matter what you're going through, God is there. It's interesting as you read this verse in context, that promise is preceded by a command. It says this, and I'm going to read from the New English translation. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For I will never leave you nor forsake you, the text would say. See, instead of trusting in anything else that we can see, Income, material goods, which will ultimately fail. God promises, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. See, faith, there is this dynamic of faith where you're letting go of fill in the blank, whatever it is, and grabbing a hold of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. He says, come to me, not to your best friend, not to mindlessly streaming entertainment, not to your profession, not even to your spouse, not your next trip, business adventure, not a hobby, not a distraction or a relationship or the next stage in your life or career, but he says, come to me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. Come to him and he will come to you. See, there's this dynamic of faith, of letting go and grabbing a hold of Jesus. And that's what Jairus is doing here. And that can be our experience as well. In the midst of this encounter, it's interesting. It's like the plot thickens with what Mark writes. The, the crowds are thronging around Jesus. This guy Jairus shows up, a synagogue leader who most would have respected, known that he has a place of position. He, he's begging at the feet of Jesus to come, and Jesus says, I'll go with you. And look at what it says in verse 24. All the people, the, they're following they're crowding around. Okay, there goes Jesus. There goes Jairus. Let's, let's see what happens. And verse 25 tells us a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She would suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she'd gotten no better. In fact, 
She'd gotten worse. But as it says in verse 27, she heard about Jesus. Jesus is on his way with his disciples, the crowd following with Jairus to heal this little 12-year-old girl. And a woman who's in the midst of this massive crowd has had this issue of constant bleeding for 12 long years, desperate to be healed. Why? 12 years? I mean, no one likes to be sick or have an ongoing struggle. I mean, in the season we're in right now, sinus seems to be a thing, right? 12 days of sinus pressure? No, thank you. Flu-like symptoms is enough to drive anyone to a breaking point after almost two weeks. But this woman's issue is more serious than a little bit of pressure, a nagging cough, or just trouble keeping her blood pressure under control. For 12 years, she's seen doctor after doctor. And maybe some of you have experienced that dynamic of trying to get to the bottom of what's going on in your body, seeing physician after physician, there's an element of emotional fatigue that comes with that, a sense of desperation. See, it seems like no one can help this woman. She's utterly helpless. Do you get the theme of what Mark's writing about? The disciples in the boat, they're utterly helpless. What can happen? The, the man that was possessed by demons who was in the cave, utterly helpless. Who can, ha who can help? Jairus, whose daughter is dying, no one can step in. The case is hopeless. But there's even more to this woman's story that can, can sometimes be lost on us. You see, disease influenced everyone in this culture. This is kind of the pre-aspirin, pre-minute clinic, pre-telehealth world, right? In the first century, there's no way to differentiate between infectious and, and non-infectious blood conditions. So Jewish law included rigid methods for keeping their people safe if there was this dynamic from some sort of blood-borne disease. See, more than likely, this woman's health issue was related to some kind of ongoing 12-year menstrual struggle. And because of that, because of what was written in Levitical law, she experienced the same social isolation, social curses, I guess you could say, as lepers, being a total outcast, ceremonially unclean. And this in and of itself would have been debilitating for this woman. Whenever she sat down or laid down, that which she touched would have been called unclean. If she touched someone, a family member, they were unclean until they bathed and washed. She, she wasn't allowed to step into synagogue or the temple She's got to be desperate. She can't participate in her community. She can't touch anyone. For anything that she would touch would be unclean. And if anyone touched what she touched, they would be unclean. Her body is wrecked. Her finances were wrecked. Her relationships wrecked. If she had a husband, couldn't touch her. Friends couldn't be near her. This woman was totally removed from the religious and social life of her community. And the situation for this poor woman is just getting worse. You know, where she's at in this story, she's not allowed to be there. She's amongst a crowd. She's not supposed to touch or be near anyone. The, the, her mere presence there makes her an outlaw. But just like Jairus, she heard of someone who could cure the incurable. And so it would seem that this woman and Jairus are both equal parts, desperation and faith. And look at what Mark tells us in verse 27. She'd heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. And Mark records for us in verse 29 that immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. This woman was desperate for Jesus. And with all of her challenges, pushing past all possible excuses, she reaches out 
to Jesus. You know, in the original language, it says that she's, she's pushing through the crowd, doing something she probably hasn't done in years, touching people as she's going through the crowd. She's defiling everyone along the way. Is she, is she sneaking on the ground? Is she crawling between legs? She's pushing to get to Jesus, working hard to get to the Lord. And all the while, it seems like the text tells us she's just kind of muttering to herself, encouraging herself, if I can just get to him, if I can just touch him, I don't have anything. I've lost everything. I've lost everyone. If I could just touch Jesus. And the moment she does, she's healed. She's healed. And Jesus notices, verse 30, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? And his disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? There are a whole lot of people touching Jesus. And it almost seems like the text would say that the disciples are like, I don't know if they're mocking. I doubt that would kind of step, but they're like, what? Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? There were all these bodies, all these people just pressing up against Jesus, but her faith touched Jesus, and she was changed. She was healed. Now, this is interesting to me. Say, what do you mean? Obviously, a healing is interesting. But how Mark describes this, he could have described this in many different ways. He said she touched Jesus. You know, there's a word in that language of Greek that means to touch, to just touch the surface of. There's another word that means to, to just barely touch. And then there's a word that means to exert a modifying influence, grabbing a hold of, like a two-year-old, right? Like grabbing onto those pants. That's this woman. She's laying a hold of Jesus. Exerting all of her strength and ability that she had, she reaches out to touch him, to grab a hold of him. I want to share with you a few other Bible commentators and pastors what they share about this point. I find it so interesting. One author says this, there is a huge difference between bumping into Jesus here and there and reaching out to touch him in faith. You can come to church week after week and bump into Jesus, so to speak. But that isn't the same as reaching out to him to touch him in faith. Quoting from a famous preacher, the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon wrote this, it's not every contact with Christ that saves men. It's the arousing of yourself to come near to him. The determinate, the personal, resolute, believing touch of Jesus Christ, which saves. Augustine, a church father, once said this, Flesh presses, but faith touches. He can always distinguish between the jostle of a curious mob and the agonized touch of a needy soul. See, I kind of want to say this again. Come to him, and he will come to you. Faith is this dynamic of, of letting go and grabbing a hold of Jesus. That was Jairus' experience. This was her experience, and this can be our experience too. This kind of touch of faith translated into something miraculous. Immediately, she was healed. She was all in. Her faith was in Jesus. She believed that she could be healed. What's the point? We're not to just touch the surface of, or just to be loosely connected to the things of God, but to grab a hold of, to be all in to have faith. You know, the author of Hebrews tells us that it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. This woman had a full array of emotions. She's completely healed. She notices that it happens immediately. And she realizes that Jesus is looking for. Her. Look at verse 32. It says that he kept on looking to see who had done it. And once again, we see this, this awe or this sense of fright or 
this response like we have with these other two scenes. It says in verse 33, the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. Remember, she's not supposed to be there. But she just touched a rabbi, a popular rabbi. And any other rabbi being touched by a ceremonially unclean woman, what would they have said to this woman? What does this mean for her? Is she going to be exposed? She confesses what she's done. And this rabbi, any other rabbi, might have said, woman. But what does he say in verse 34? Daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. There's something different about Jesus. Those first century readers would have known that any other rabbi that would have been touched, now he's got to go take a bath. But Jesus, when he's touched by one who's defiled, the defiled one becomes clean. And Jesus does three things here that are amazing. He calls her daughter. That's got to be something she hasn't heard in years. She's back in the fold of the family of Israel. She's back in community. He, he recognizes her as one who's back a part of the family, so to speak. Twelve years of exclusion, and now she's included. He celebrates her faith. See, she didn't come there and kind of like steal the blessing from Jesus. No. He's saying she received it. He wanted her to know that. Imagine if he would have just kept on trucking and not said anything. Jesus made a point to tell her, you're my daughter. You're included. Your, your faith has made you whole. And he gives her this sense of shalom, peace, a Hebrew concept that means wholeness, prosperity, security, saying, listen, you're healed. It's not coming back. It's like those songs that we sung earlier about the forgiveness that Jesus brings, the freedom that he brings. It's this sense of full blessing upon her life. See, here's what I want to say, and we're almost done, but I want you to catch this. In all three of these instances that we've seen so far in chapter 4 and here in chapter 5, We've seen Jesus' authority and position as the King, as the Messiah, as the Son of God. All experience this reality that he does something that only he can do. And everyone's response so far, at one level or another, is a sense of awe. A sense of, what? When Jesus calmed the winds and the waves... The disciples said, who is this man? When Jesus displayed victory and authority over the demonic, when Jesus heals of this disease, there's this dynamic within this woman of just frightness. Now, is it because, okay, what's going to happen to me? Maybe. But there is this theme that just seems to be coming through each and every single encounter with Jesus, that there's this recognition that this man is different that this man, Jesus, danger, demons, and disease can't stop him. Why? You know why. Because Jesus is the king. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the son of God, sovereign and all powerful. That's who he is. And while all this is happening, it says in verse 35, while Jesus is still speaking to this woman, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. This moment can't be overemphasized. It's like the boom is dropped over Jairus and all those that are headed with Jesus to see this little girl healed. And after this great moment of God's miraculous power on display, Jesus says this, Jairus, Jairus, don't give up. You had the faith to come to me in the first place. Keep on believing. Don't stop. Now, in my weird 1980s mindset, that song comes up, don't stop, right? Like, I don't know that that's what we should be thinking about, but like, 
But it's that mindset, right? Like, don't stop believing. Jairus, you've just seen me heal this woman. Hang with me. Hang with me, Jairus. And so it says in verse 37, Jesus stopped the crowd, wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping. At that time, some would actually hire professional weepers that would come. That may be some of those that were there. It may be some that were genuine. But he went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, Jesus says. She's only asleep. She's asleep. You know, often when Jesus was on earth, he describes death as sleep. Think about that encounter in John chapter 11 with Lazarus. He said, our friend Lazarus in chapter 11, verse 11, has fallen asleep, but I will go and wake him up. And the disciples are kind of confused. They say, Lord, if he's asleep, he's going to get better. And they thought that he just meant that Lazarus was sleeping. But it says, Jesus told them plainly, plainly no, Lazarus is dead. Why does Jesus say here that she's asleep? There's, there's weepers. Every, everyone knows she's dead. Well, Jesus speaks of death as sleep because he has power over death. This doesn't mean, nor does the Bible teach in this idea of soul sleep, which you may have heard of, that when we die, our souls kind of go into a dormant state. The Bible doesn't teach that, but it teaches that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. But in a way, and in a sense, our physical bodies go to sleep until the resurrection. And what does the crowd do? Look at verse 40. They laughed at him, but he made them all leave took the girl's father and mother and the three disciples into a room where the girl was lying and holding her hand, he said, Talith Koum, which simply means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. And they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. And Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And he told them to give her something to eat. The crowd laughs. Why? Because of a lack of faith? Maybe for sure, but also she wasn't sleeping. Everyone could see that she was dead. And Jesus was very tender in this moment. Takes this little girl. The language he uses isn't some form of mystic incantation or magic. It's just Aramaic. It's a tender way, an endearing way to speak to the little girl to just simply stand. And not only does she come back from the dead, but the disease, the sickness, whatever she had before, it's completely gone. She's up. She's bouncing around. And he tells her parents to get her something to eat. She's ready to get back to life as a 12-year-old. And he tells all those there not to spread this news around. Why? Jesus isn't looking for more followers on his TikTok feed, right? He's not wanting to encourage a sense of fanatical fandom around miracles. That's not his point. He's not a sideshow. And all those who were there, those five witnesses, overwhelmed and amazed. Why? You know why. Like we've reached the end of these four different episodes. Danger, demons, disease, not even death can stop Jesus because Jesus is the King. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. He's sovereign and all-powerful. That's what these four accounts show us. Now, as we close this morning, and as we kind of prepare our hearts for communion, here's how I want to leave us this morning as we consider this text. See, one of the things I wanted to make sure I had the opportunity to do as I opened up this text this morning is to clearly and simply share with you why what is written is written. It's to show and to give evidence to the reality of who Jesus is. But I also, if I can... I'd like to leave us in a place of tension. Say, what do you mean? You know, in life, there is this dynamic to discern often. The difference between a problem to solve and a tension to balance. I'm learning you don't solve parenting. Can I get an amen to that, right? You live in a, you don't solve relationships. You don't, some things are problems to solve. The sink is broke. Oh, we can fix that. But some things are tensions to balance. The focal point 
the big idea of the text before us, it's about Jesus. That's what it's about. Who he is and what he can do. But one of the things that this text evidences beyond the big idea of who Jesus is, is faith. Faith. Jairus with a 12-year-old daughter, born out of suffering and desperation, produced faith in Jesus. A woman with a 12-year issue of blood, born out of suffering and desperation, faith in Jesus. And in both scenarios... Jesus brings focus to faith. Verse 34, he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Verse 36, Jesus is speaking to Jairus and he says, don't be afraid, just have faith. The topic, the focus of faith seems to, at least the best that I can tell, play a significant part in this story. Please catch this. It's not the main point. Jesus is the main point, who he is and what he alone can do. That's why, like, I just berated that point. This is who he is. This is what it's about. It's about Jesus, Messiah, Son of God, the King. But it was faith that brought both of these two individuals to Jesus in the first place. And it would seem that without it, well, Jairus' daughter wouldn't have been healed. If he didn't have the faith to go to the beach that morning, if he didn't have the faith to just continue to hang with Jesus, even though it seemed like all was lost, if that woman would have just made excuses, oh, look, he's there with Jairus. That, that's the leader of the synagogue. I can't go near him. His daughter's dying. I don't want to bother them. This woman would have been left in pain, isolation, destitute, and despair. Faith played a significant role in the outcome of this story. And it wasn't just a nonchalant, lackadaisical, convenient kind of faith. I mean, this woman had to risk it to get to Jesus. If someone would have recognized her, hey, that's that woman. She's touching people. She can't be doing that. Jairus, he's the leader of the synagogue. What if the Pharisees would have seen him there? See, why, why do you bring this to a point? Here's what I want to say. I think that for some of us in the room, this is what's lacking, and this is what's needed. What do you mean? Not to just bump into Jesus. Not to just touch him lightly. But to, as the text says about this woman touching Jesus, exert a modifying influence to grab a hold of Jesus, to come to him, and realize that he will come to you to, to let go of whatever it is you're holding on to and grab hold of Jesus. That's faith. So you can't walk away from this woman with a 12-year issue and this dad with a 12-year-old daughter and say that faith didn't have a significant part to play in the healing and the miracle that they experienced. It most definitely did. But here's the tension you've got to live in. Right? Some things are problems to solve. Some things are tensions to balance. This isn't the only account of God moving in a way in which he heals and does the miraculous. If I can, I'd love to encourage you to grab that teaching that Pastor John gave a few weeks ago on healing. It's one of the best and balanced teachings I've ever heard on the topic. And one of the things that he shares, I want to share in this moment that there are some instances where one's faith is significant, like what we're reading here in Mark 5. But that there's other instances in Scripture, Mark 2. You know that, that paralyzed man that's led through the roof by his friends? It seems like the faith of his friends led to his healing. In Luke chapter 7, there's this account where Jesus sees that a widow's son has died. There's no mention of faith at all and Jesus heals and resurrects. John chapter 9, there's this man who's blind, and Jesus with mud heals the man. And as you read through John chapter 9, the man doesn't even know who Jesus is, and yet he's healed. See, here's what I want to say. 
There is this truth that needs to be known and embraced. God's healing touch is not always dependent upon the volume of our faith. It's not always this case that, well, you just don't believe enough. You're just not, there's got to be something going on with you. That's why God hasn't touched. Healing is mysterious. But also, I want to say this. Where are you today? Christ is sufficient. Know that. Are you willing to draw near and touch him? Let go of the things of the world and reach out to touch, to pursue him. That's what this woman did. That's what this dad did. See, I, I want us to leave us in this tension. You say, what do you mean? We may not have an issue of blood, but all of us have issues. Yes? No? And there's this tension to live in. It's not a problem to solve. I just got to have more faith. That's what Neil said. That's what I got out of Maybe, maybe that's where you are, right? Maybe you've heard some sort of depressing thing that's just happened. Man, the, your daughter's dead, Jairus. And Jesus would say, hey, you just need to keep on believing, right? You got to have that journey soundtrack playing over your, your airwaves. You need to know that. Hang in there. Maybe that's what God's saying to some. Maybe for others, there's this dynamic like this woman grabbing a hold of Jesus. We've got our hands so full of other things in this world, it's clouding and diffusing and distancing our faith and intimacy with Jesus. Maybe. But I would say this. Let's allow this time of communion to be a time for us to come to him, to come to him. Let him come to us because he first came to us through the cross. See, we don't have to prime the pump of God to get him to notice us. He came. He died. He rose again so that we can be with him. And where I want to leave us this morning, as we consider this text and now prepare our hearts for communion, it is this place of tension. But I hope that it's a calling to just go all in with Jesus. To, to grab a hold of him, to be willing to be like that dad on that beach that morning that say, Jesus, I'm here. I'm here. Sometimes suffering and desperation produce that kind of faith. That's what it was for Jairus. That's what it was for this woman. But can it be also to be reminded of how good God is through the cross this morning to bring us to a fresh place of surrender to say, Jesus, I want to be all in with you. I want my trust, I want my faith, I want my hope to be in you. And to reach out and to grab a hold afresh of this wonderful King, Messiah, and Son of God, who disease, death, the demonic, danger cannot touch him. That's the point of these four episodes, to show you who Jesus is. But our response would be to let go of anything else that we would cling to for identity or security and recognize that our souls find their complete serenity alone in Jesus. So may he be the one that we grab a hold of this morning in a fresh and in a real way. And what a phenomenal way to do that this morning than in the way that Jesus told us to remember him by taking communion together.